So we're very well coordinated here. Uh, our final speaker for the pa panel is Yuve Guluma. Yuve Guluma is an Israeli Liberi Liberian humanitarian and development worker with 10 years of experience in a range of contexts, including conflict zones, countries in transition, and, and disaster prone areas. The main focus of her work is supporting rural and urban food security and livelihoods, hence her invitation to come here. She's worked with UNICEF, the World Food Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and other UN agencies in a variety of projects in Europe and in Africa. Her MSc is in Social Policy and Planning in Developing Countries from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Yuve. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I am going to be uh, discussing uh, the food security situation in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I, I don't really come from a science background, so this is mainly looking at maybe socio-economic aspects. I did do biology as my undergraduate, and I was also well on my way to doing medicine, following in my father's and, and brother's footsteps too, but decided to take too long. So in the end, I focused on the, the social sciences. It does. It takes forever, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so the objective here is really to give you a, more of a description of what is the current food security situation in sub-Saharan Africa, what are the key determinants. Um, I'll be mainly discussing issues around um, the different dimensions of availability, access to food, economic and physical, and um, uh, stability and certain nu nutritional aspects. And I'll touch upon the impact of the uh, recent high food price and global financial crises on uh, food security in sub-Saharan Africa. And also, sorry, climate change and HIV AIDS, because I think there's a lot of people who don't make the connection between the pandemic and food security. Um, I'm not going to go into any an analysis of policies or global trends that are actually influencing uh, food security in sub-Saharan Africa. This is beyond the scope of, of my presentation. Okay. Currently, it's estimated that one in three people 239 million people um, are actually chronically hungry in sub-Saharan Africa. This represents more or less a quarter of the world's undernourished. Um, and actually the proportion of undernourished to total population is probably the highest in the world. Sub-Saharan Africa also has the highest rate of stunting. Stunting is when, it, of child stunting, is when a child actually doesn't grow the proper height in comparison to age. Um, so it's a shocking 43%. It's the world high, world's highest. Um, and it's probably the only region in the world where hunger um, is expected to worsen in the next two decades. And of course, with hunger, many people associate hunger with conflict situations and with uh, especially drought. And as we can see in sub-Saharan Africa, there have been numerous drought events, mainly in East Africa, Horn of Africa, try the laser, uh, and the Sahel region, which is here. Uh, these areas in dark red are where we've had probably more than 10 severe droughts in the past uh, uh, three decades. Now you... Sorry? What? Is it representing a trend or a of drug? Of course, I'll come a bit to that. Uh, it's of course it's becoming more and more frequent with climate change, um, and of course with drought, uh, often we associate uh, famines or a major food crisis crises. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, on your television screens in the past decade, for example a number of well-known uh, food crises, crises. I don't know if we can call it actually famine. South Africa in 2002, where it was attribu attributed to drought and floods, four million were threatened by severe food shortages. You had Niger in 2005, um, and this was blamed on droughts and locusts. About five million people face uh, severe food shortages. 
you had Today, you have the Horn of Africa, 2011-2012, uh, where a drought and the Somali conflict are actually um, uh, affecting uh, food security. And last I heard, 13 million people were hungry. But all these food crises, crises were followed, were preceded by probably similar crises, crises of similar proportions and were followed by the same. Niger, for example, where currently there's a major food crisis looming in Niger and many countries in the Sahel. Um, so this is something that's happened in the past and mistakes have been made, but it's, it still continues. I'm not going to go into definition because I think someone already did it. Just to tell you that since the 1975 World Food Conference, the definition has evolved from purely availability uh, to now availability, access, stability, and utilization. Uh, again, I think the, you, you uh, presented the four aspects. Just to say, without these four uh, uh, dimensions of availability, accessibility, utilization, stability, you don't have food security. So you can have availability, you can have accessibility, you can have utilization, but if there's no stability, of these three dimensions, you don't have food security. And this is, uh, it's very important because food security is a multi-dimensional problem. <coughs> it's not just linked to agriculture, it's linked to health, it's linked to social protection, um, various dim dimensions. This is the uh, 2011 Food Security Risk Index uh, put together by uh, a company called Maplecroft. Uh, they actually take the four indicators of availability, accessibility, uh, utilization, stability, 12 indicators within those four dimensions, and they rank countries by food, uh, risks to being food insecure. And as we can see, the, the Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, has the most extreme risk to food insecurity. And we see mainly in the Horn of Africa, and in countries that are experiencing or have experienced protracted uh, crisis. I have trouble with this word, crises, right? Okay, um, more or less. Um, and you see the top countries, the most food insecure country in the world is actually the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, followed by Somalia, uh, Burundi, Djibouti, um, etc. So why, are these, why is Sub-Saharan Africa so food insecure? The first thing we can talk about is availability, constraints to food supply. 60%, uh, depending on how, 60 to 70%, depending on how you, you see it, of the population actually depends for their livelihoods on mainly rain-fed, um, low-input agriculture based on archaic methods of farming. 93% of agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa is rain-fed. Only 4% of arable land is actually irrigated. Low input, low fertilization use, both organic and chemical. 75% um, of agriculture actually still uses rudimentary tools, the hoe, the cutlass, the watering can, um, and ar archaic methods of, of farming. Um, and of course, this not surprising, cereal yields have only increased about 30% over the past 40 years, compared to 177% in Latin America and 144% in Asia. And to fill this deficit, Sub-Saharan Africa is very reliant on, on imports, which is 26%. In the 60s, it was only 1%. One, 1%. And you have what you call, and Bernard discussed that, the missing food where you have very important post-harvest grain losses due to lack of storage, handling, marketing, transportation, etc., of 15% of harvest. This 15% actually is equal to the annual amount, value of food imports. This 15% is actually, actually exceeds the total amount of food aid that Sub-Saharan Africa has received in the past 10 years. So, 
I think uh, you can understand there's a lot that can be done regarding storage and processing, marketing, transportation. But of course, availability, like we said, is not the, the important, most important issue. And at times, it's, I mean, not the only issue. At, at times, I've seen in countries where I've worked, like the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's been surplus in a war-torn country, but there's just been no access to markets. Um, you've seen in even the Wall of Famine of 1974 in Ethiopia, that famine happened when there was surplus production in the country in another region. So accessibility as far as um, uh, economic accessibility um, and physical accessibility is very important. Approx most of, the, uh, sorry, most of the, the people living in extreme poverty actually come from sub-Saharan Africa. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, they live on less than one dollar a day. Uh, most of it is rural uh, poverty, um, and most of the, of the population in rural areas depends on agriculture. 60% uh, of income is spent on food compared to 10 to 20% in, in uh, consumer spending in the developed country. Um, and then, of course, uh, aside from the economic access, you have poor transportation in adequate markets. This has a negative effect on travel time. In, in about a quarter to, uh, uh, sorry, 30% of the population in most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they need four, and, four to eight hours to reach a market. In countries such as Ethiopia and Zambia, half the population needs eight hours to reach a market. And of course you have high cost of inputs because there's a lack of transportation, so it costs to bring inputs in, and that raises the price of, of uh, certain uh, farm inputs. Farm gate prices are very low because people can't access markets to trade their goods, sell their goods. They have to depend on middlemen in sub-Saharan Africa. They have no market information, even on their mobile telephones. So they're, and then they're desperate to sell their produce straight after the harvest because they have to cover certain debts, um, etc. And then, of course, consumer prices go down, uh, go are high because the lack of markets, there are certain products that are... are that can't reach the market easily, and when they do, they're quite costly. Like I said, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rate of, of chronic malnutrition. Um, there is a difference between landlocked countries and coastal. It's twice as high as in, uh, in the Sahel as in the coastal uh, countries normally. Um, uh, it's, it's a lot higher in rural areas, it's uh, higher than in rural areas than in urban areas, um, etc. And of course you have not just, you know, how many kilocalories you consume, energetic consumption. You have what we call hidden hunger, which is a lack of micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, such as a lack of iodine, iron, vitamin A. I think you have uh, about uh, half a million children who die because of vitamin A deficiency related causes. You have 14% of infants that are born with a low birth weight rate because their mothers are lacking iron, they're anemic. Um, and there are various reasons for food intake and poor, poor utilization of nutrients by the body. Um, but often, uh, for food, sorry, for malnutrition, often there is a po poverty bias in a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, sub Africa. It's very important. But it's, it's not the only cause. And I know chronic malnutrition is often, uh, uh, stunting is often a proxy of uh, uh, chronic poverty, but it's not always the case. Um, you can have high malnutrition rates in quite wealthy areas in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's more linked to uh, child feeding practices, early weaning, non-exclusive breastfeeding, um, and to the health and sanitation environment. I've seen this very often in my work where um, there's richer parts of, for example, Senegal, the area called Matam, where in the north, they actually, it's called the Eurozone, they receive remittances from abroad, and they have also have the highest uh, uh, chronic poverty rate, a wealthier area, but the problem is the health and sanitation environment and the poor ethnic group uh, uh, tends to have young mothers, um, poor child feeding practices, and certain cultural taboos regarding uh, food consumption. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, all these uh, um, 
all these dimensions have to have some sort of stability. Uh, you have uh, seasonal instability in sub-Saharan Africa. It's usually during the hunger period, June to August, for example, um, when household stocks are actually depleted um, and they rely on the market uh, for food. Um, so this definitely influences availability, but also uh, accessibility in terms of prices, because what you have is the uh, typical African farmer will sell his or her produce straight after the harvest at very low prices. Uh, as most of the time the cereal market is, is monopolized by a, a few traders. They will keep the cereal until the hunger period, where the same farmer will buy back his cereal at significantly high prices. There you go, you have an instability of prices, a lot higher during the, the hunger period. Seasonal instability also in utilization, where you have higher periods of malnutrition related to the hunger period, but also related to the rainy season. When you have uh, a lot of vector-borne, waterborne diseases, diarrheal diseases, malaria, and uh, I don't know if you all know this, but uh, infectious diseases are quite synergetic with malnutrition. It's, it affects how the body utilizes nutrients. Um, you have protracted crises. crises. Uh, 22 uh, uh, countries in the world are facing protracted crises, crises. 17 of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. Five of them are the most extreme, have the most extreme risks to food insecurity. So this disrupts livelihoods and there's an, also an over-exploitation of natural resources which is the basis for having stability in, in uh, food security. You had the 2007-2008 high fuel and food prices where the price of, uh, of cereals went high and certain net importers of cereals like Senegal for example, Malawi, um, a, a majority of the population could not um, afford uh, to buy uh, cereals, the, the staple food. They, in correlation with that, you should, they saw a high rise of the number of children who suffered from um, malnutrition. You have the global financial economic crisis of 2009. This, uh, in, globally across um, Africa, remittances were, were reduced. The money coming from abroad from relatives, which is mainly used for uh, the purchase of food and for basic needs such as health and education. Um, uh, globally, it was something like 5% of GDP, and they saw 7% decline in actually remittances. Um, and again, that led to uh, um, um, uh, 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 high rate, higher rates of food insecurity, uh, uh, and unemployment, etc. So all these uh, global trends have had an impact on food security in Africa especially. And this trend is probably going to continue into the next decade or so. And of course you have uh, the biggest threat to probably food security in Africa is climate change. Uh, it's expected to, to warm three to four degrees uh, more. Um, there are supposed to be more frequent high intensity, intensity sporadic uh, rain events. This is going to have a negative impact on soil quality and crop production. Uh, 13 countries in sub-Saharan Africa will experience by 2025 uh, water stress and 10 water scarcity. Um, and then there will be a general dis the the decrease in crop productivity except for higher altitude uh, countries uh, resulting in an increased price of staples. For example, uh, sweet potato and, uh, and yams with climate change projections, it's ex we're expected to see a fall of, by 2050, a um, uh, decrease of around a quarter and an increase of around a quarter in, in prices. And this is a staple for um, the majority of the sub-Saharan African uh, population. We'll also see, of course, with a drop in crop, crop production, um, uh, an extended hungry, hungry season. I've already, I already saw this starting in, in countries like, like Senegal. The period in the month where there's no food stocks will probably extend, be, be longer because of the fall in production levels. 
you have the HIV and AIDS pandemic, um, uh, most of uh, the HIV and AIDS affected households are actually in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and the most affected area in the world is uh, Southern Africa, where prevalence rates, HIV prevalence rates can go up to uh, or, uh, exceed 20% for certain countries like uh, Swaziland, Botswana, and Lesotho. You have about probably, uh, I think in 2010, 1.2 million people died of AIDS and another 1.9 million people were affected by the, by the HIV virus. What does HIV AIDS have to do with food security? Uh, a lot. Um, what tends to happen, I'm going to try and do this really fast because I'm running out of time. Um, I'm not going to look at, the, it, there's a vicious cycle between nutrition and food security and the pandemic. But I'm only going to discuss briefly the impact of HIV AIDS on food security. When a household member falls ill, um, you tend to have certain assets, the human, financial, social, uh, natural and physical, which are required actually for livelihood, required for agricultural production. Human means knowledge and skills, financial savings income, uh, natural and physical uh, could be livestock, land, etc. What happens is they have to pay for medical bills, for example. So really quickly their, their financial capital is lost. They'll sell livestock. And this is a, a situation we're actually seeing in Southern Africa, um, especially in Southern Africa. So they lose a lot of capital trying to pay for health bills. When someone dies, they pay for funerals. Um, and that's the, the effect you have there. Some of them sell land. Um, what happens also is that they lose access to credit due to stigmatization, discrimination. Uh, you have certain effects on institutions such as agriculture, health, where there's absenteeism, absence. Um, it's greatly affected in countries like Zimbabwe. 60% of extension workers have lost a colleague to um, uh, the disease, for example. How do households respond with a loss of labor and skills? Very often what's happening is that they cut down on the amount of land that's going to be cultivated. They shift from uh, cash crops towards uh, uh, labor, less labor intensive crops, less nutritious such as cassava or the white sweet potato. Um, they, because of loss, lack of labor, uh, also you have, for example, the woman who will, or female that will go more into care, taking care of the sick person, um, you have uh, less uh, maintenance of the land too. So slowly that land is actually starting to lose its uh, quality. How many? Oh, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> and then of course um, uh, they start to lose income, enter into uh, more extreme poverty, they cut down on meals, the body becomes vulnerable again, sick, etc. And it's a whole vicious cycle. But what's important, for example, in Zambia, um, no, sorry, Swaziland, you saw a reduction of about 50% in certain key crops um, in output levels due to a family member falling ill and dying, for example. So it has a very uh, uh, significant impact on food security. Sorry I had to rush through this. Now if we relook at the crisis in Southern Africa and Niger, um, I'm not sure if I can explain this in five minutes, but I'm going to try and, and do it. Um, was it just due to drought and uh, floods in Niger due to drought and locust? Uh, the causes were a lot more deep-rooted. Uh, Southern Africa, for example, during the, the 1970s and 80s, um, uh, the, the po population poverty rate started to decline. You had uh, the price of copper that went down. A lot of migrants lost their jobs in, in South, South African mines. And then you had the notorious IMF-led structural adjustment programs that actually uh, encouraged uh, um, governments to remove support to agricultural, um, to, to farmers. So a lot of farmers lost their agricultural subsidies, subs subsidies, um, seeds, 
um, improved variety of seeds, hybrid mice, my, maize seeds, um, and from that agricultural, the, I mean, they lost a lot of support from agriculture. If they could not actually um, earn as much income from it, feed their families as much, and you saw altogether those factors of structural adjustment uh, programs. Um, um, uh, and then loss of, of, of income from mines, etc., uh, decline in, into poverty. Um, I know Zambia, for example, in, in, certain, in a certain study, about they saw a reduction in many households of about 43% of land that was actually under maize cultivation, and they attributed that to the removal of, of uh, 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 fertilizer subsidies. Um, so all this coupled with um, the HIV AIDS pandemic actually brought it probably to the edge of vulnerability where as soon as you have a price shock or production shock, you have a great number of people who, who become severely food insecure. Niger is very complicated. I'm not even sure if I, if I understand it myself. Uh, do you know that in Niger in 2005, I don't know if you all saw the, the images on the TV. Uh, Niger in 2005 was like Ethiopia in 1985 almost. What happened was that this year, 2005, was not the worst uh, harvest. It was actually better than the, than the prior five-year average. It was better by 30% than the uh, harvest they had in 2000. But yet 2000 with failures in harvest did not lead to a, a food crisis. So what was really going on in Niger? First of all, Niger is the second poorest country in the world. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. The crisis actually happened in the most wealthy part of Niger, the bread basket of Niger. This, this area of Niger actually um, produced the most of the millet cereal for the rest of the country. Um, the problem is it also had the highest chronic poverty, chronic malnutrition rates in Niger. So it's a wealthy area of Niger, but with high chronic malnutrition. Um, and obviously it's probably linked to other factors than food availability. This area had the highest child mortality, highest rates of diarrhea, diarrhea and, and the worst child feeding practices. Within that region also you had intra-regional um, differences of land distribution um, uh, and incomes. It was an area that was very much based on, on, on uh, cereal production for trade with Nigeria. It was very market oriented, very dependent on the market, especially those um, households that actually over time had sold their assets, their livestock, their land and um, started to move more towards, ca towards casual farm labor. What happened in 2005 is that Nigeria failed to produce a good enough harvest. M most of the time they imported from Nigeria um, and Burkina Faso also. They uh, implemented protectionist um, uh, measures. They closed their borders. They did not allow millet to come through into Niger. But what happened is that the Nigerian, Nigerian market was is mo monopolized by a few traders who decided lower purchasing power in Niger, higher purchasing power in Nigeria, and, they, and what we saw was uh, the export of the millet into Nigeria. So we have a country that was chronically uh, poor, and in the bread basket area with already high rates of chronic malnutrition, probably linked to other things, Maybe for the first time in a long time, they had availability issues and accessibility issues. They could not access their own grain at such a high price because it was going to the richer Nigerians across the border. And the, the traders actually did not put the grain on the market because they put the grain on the market in Nigeria. So food security in Africa is quite complicated. It's linked to accessibility. It's linked to availability. It's linked to how policies work, market policies work, um, etc. Sorry, I would have gone into more detail, but I don't have much time. So key challenges, high rural poverty rates, underdeveloped rural inf infrastructure and services, and we're not just talking about agriculture. We're talking about health facilities, 
um, and uh, sanitation facilities, uh, infrastructure that actually links all the sectors that contribute to food security. We have the, the climate change, where there are new risks and vulnerabilities, as well as, ch as challenges to mitigation and adaptation. And then you have, at the bottom of it all, you can send over a hybrid the varieties, more improved varieties of seeds, you can send over technology, but if you do not have the food policies in place and the investment in agriculture, it's grown over the 40, past 40 years only by 0.6% in sub-Saharan Africa, then nothing, you're not going to make much of a difference. Um, and from policy to implementation, that's another challenge. And a lot of it has to do with poor governance issues how actually projects are managed, uh, about transparency, etc. So it's uh, quite a complicated picture. Sorry, I'm under pressure to finish. <laughs> okay.